No. Nah. I need it, thank you. Hi guys, this is Charles. I'm one of the surgeons at South Pauls. Today we're doing a forelimb amputation in a very large Rhodesian Ridgeback for an osteosarcoma of the distal radius. Uh, that osteosarcoma has been confirmed on a biopsy and we did a CT scan um, to look at the lungs uh, to make sure there is an evidence of secondary spread. If you haven't already done so, please subscribe to our channel. Make sure you turn on notifications so that you'll get a ding on your phone the next time we live stream. Um, so just making my initial incision here. Under the spine of the scapula? Along parallel to the spine of the scapula, as Laura has indicated. Sorry, that's a question. What's that? That was a question. You made it sound like a statement, and since it was correct, <laughs> it was a good thing. And my goal is to do this whole amputation and just use one lap sponge, but we'll see how we go. So this is a transversarius here that I'm getting through. We'll have the chat going, um, and I will try to answer your questions as we go along. Sorry, am I stepping on something? So that's um, a transversarius there, and then we'll get up into trapezius up higher. So once I get in, this is a Rhodesian Ridgeback, a lar large dog. It's about 45 kilos. 45, how much is it weigh? 46.7 kilos. And this dog, even though it's a large breed dog and it's a forelimb, is going to do fine with an amputation. We had a big discussion about whether we would do a limb salvage surgery or an amputation. And I finally convinced him to go the amputation. Limb salvage surgery is really only reserved for either dogs with orthopedic disease in other legs or neurologic disease or owners that really refuse to do an amputation. Uh, limb salvage surgery is associated with a lot more complications or risk of complications in amputation. And the risks with limb salvage surgery, potential risks include um, recurrence of the tumor, infection, Interestingly, infection doubles the survival time with osteosarcoma um, with limb salvage surgery. And we're getting some twitching here. For everybody who's watching, if it's not because the dog is waking up, it is because direct muscle stimulation. So I've gone through almost transversarius trapezius muscle here. Um, so other complications include recurrence of the tumor, infection, and biomechanical failure of the repair. So now I'm coming around quarterly here. Can we get a stool for Laura, please? I'm getting a stool for Laura because she's gonna to have to hold this leg up while I um, tie off the vessels medially. And this dog is eight years of age, which is the median age of dogs with osteosarcoma. So I'm just gonna reflect this skin caudally. Uh, go ahead and hold on to that with the thumb force. We're gonna come around the back and we'll transect the latissimus dorsi muscle. That's the main one back here.
Uh, if you haven't joined our closed Facebook group, um, check it out. So it's on, um, just go to Facebook and then look up groups and look for South Pause. Um, and in that closed Facebook group, you have to be in the veterinary industry, which means you're either a veterinarian or a nurse or a, um, basically it's veterinarian or nurse. And then we have some case discussions. We announce webinars and things like that. So if you haven't done that, um, really recommend that you do it. So uh, just ask to join and then you'll be asked the question, which is how are you related to the veterinary industry and just a simple, I'm a vet or I'm a vet nurse or I'm a vet student or whatever is fine. So the lateral thoracic vessel will be in here somewhere. And then this is latissimus dorsi muscle right in here. So that's the aponeurosis of the latissimus dorsi muscle right there. If you can cut through the aponeurosis, it's a little bit less painful and they bleed less. Thank you very much. <laughs> Who was that? Uh, Piyush. Yeah. Hi, Piyush. How are you? Okay, so that's underneath latissimus dorsi right there. There's actually more of it up there. Can you retract that forward up here? And then there's Kimberly. Um, remove the the what the pectoral girdle. Yep. I haven't called it a pectoral girdle. We remove the pectoral muscles, but I don't know if pectoral girdle is a human term. So that's more latissimus muscle right there. Can you? And this is not the dog feeling it, it's just the twitching from direct stimulation from the electric artery of the muscle. And just also the scapula. Uh, scapula is coming out. I always do amputations front leg amputations by scapulectomy. I find it to be an easier surgery. Cosmetically, they do better. I think they're probably less painful as well. And, uh, you know, every time I do an amputation, people always say, oh, why don't you do a mid-femoral or mid-humeral amputation or a scapulohumeral disarticulation? But, and you can definitely do it either way, but I just believe that, um, that, Scapulectomy is the way to go. Okay, so that's the last of the latissimus dorsi muscle. And this one's gonna be a bit more challenging than some because it hasn't been particularly lame. And so we don't have a lot of muscle atrophy. I may not be able to um, stick to my one lap sponge. Make me very sad. See how we go. Um, I will be finished in this spot in just a minute and then I'll be back. Uh, so that's another question we often get asked. 
Um, and we don't, the, the answer to that is that we don't know. Um, I do have occasionally patients that do bite at their incisions. Um, and so we do what we can to avoid it, but um, just lift up on that. Try to keep that a bit straighter. I'm gonna come around the front here. So I'm extending my incision medially now. We're going to start going through the pectoral muscle. Is where we're working more in the center now? It's better. I get you to zoom in a little bit. Uh, zoom in. Yeah, the T. Yeah, keep going. That's great. Thank you. And we'll get a lot of twitching here just because the pectoral muscle is so big. Some people will give them atricurium to keep them from twitching. Why don't you give them atricurium? Um, because then they're, they're paralyzed as far as respiration is concerned. And I know that we have them on a ventilator, but... Um, if you finish early or whatever, and they don't spontaneously start to leave, yeah, yeah, they, that it, they last. It lasts for forty-five minutes to an hour. Um, Piyush, I assume that you're going to be live streaming yours as well. Mm -hmm. Love to see somebody else live stream. Uh, pectoral muscles? Yeah. I'm going through the superficial pec right now. Does it have a descending and transversing? I think it's just uh, super deep and superficial. Or I, I can't remember it having oh, okay. it. You were in vet school more recently than me. Mm -hmm. I think superficial has descending and transversing. Fibers, but I might be getting it. That not. So Laura is just asking if they're descending in transverse branches or limbs of the pectoral muscle, and I cannot remember that from my vet school, but that was a long time ago. If anybody knows, can come to Laura's rescue. <laughs> A big dog that we're getting a lot of bleeders that normally we just cauterize. I remember doing a great day in the step with Jeff. Another placement here. Did it bleed a lot? Yes. Just pick that up. I mean, she ended up using my sure and manual. Yeah. So I'm just getting to the end of the pectoral muscle here. Can we get some silk, please? I think we might have some out on the table already. Or you can get...
It's good. It is a bit addictive. Uh, the Highlands are a little bit more challenging to me. They're pretty similar, but if I could choose, I would do a forelimb amputation. Good job, Laura. <laughs> Thank you. All right, so now we'll just wrap this around here. Just take down a bit more of that pectoral muscle there, and we're getting right into the brachial plexus. Can I please have some mepivacaine? So we inject the vessels with mepivacaine. Uh, or sorry, inject the nerves with mepivacaine yeah. as we cut them, and that uh, provides pain relief in one study, um, provides really good pain relief. You okay? Mm -hmm. All right. So can you guys see that plexus in there? Let me just see if I can move this up a little bit. And let's zoom in so you can see me. Uh, axillary artery is going to be right in there. So that's the brachial plexus that you guys are looking at right there. Can I say if I need to Hey? Can I say if I need to Yeah, they can see well. So now we're just going to get in here with a right angle forcep and just start separating these out a little bit. So there's the axillary artery right there. And I do a little trick with it, um, which is probably totally unnecessary, but it helps keep my sponge clean. Thank you. Um, yes, please. I'll take a, a 22 first, a gray needle first. Oh, do you have, have you drawn it up already? Yeah. Okay, so just squirt it in there. So we're just getting our mepivacaine up here. Great, thank you. And then my orange needle. Uh, what's, so there's a question. So we do send the limb off for pathology um, to confirm the diagnosis, although this one we've already done a biopsy. Um, and then the rest of it just goes off to necropsy. So there's the artery right there. And so the first trick is put your finger through, grab onto the suture with your middle finger and your thumb, wrap it around your finger twice, and then pull it through. So that's kind of handy. And then I'm just going to do hand ties down here. Can I get some... 2 PDS, please. And then do you pull it up to reduce the blood? Yeah, so hold on to that down there. And then, so wrap around twice and pull it through. And then what I do is I strip the vessel so it's empty of blood so when I cut it, I don't get any blood in my field, which is kind of silly because it's like a half a mil of blood, but it looks cool. And then I'm going to do a transfictional ligature. Let's bring that back out into the field a little bit. So I've got some 2 PDS, And I'm just putting it through the vessel. Doing a knot here, and I'm going to push that through on the other side. Oh, 
Alrighty. So that's my transfectional that I've cut. I'll come out here and I'll cut the vessel. Cut my sutures there. Alrighty, and then for my next trick, we're going to inject some of these nerves before we cut them. So just right into the body of the nerve and just inject a little bit. Big fat nerve there. Which nerve was that, Laura? I couldn't say what you were doing. I couldn't. I can see it, and I don't know which one it is. We'll find out in a minute. Tell me what the leg does when I cut the nerve. Extend it. Flexion. Flexion. So that's uh, muscular cutaneous, probably. So wound soakers are great. I don't know that I don't know if people use them in amputations or not. We use them in you know those the wound soaker type catheters and other wounds. Um, the wound soaker catheters themselves are not available in Australia, but you can just use a fashion a little catheter. It's interesting, the axillary vein is bifurcated. There's a little branch right there. All right, so grab my... Um, so ligature is supposedly for vessels up to seven millimeters in diameter, although I certainly would not trust it. Um, for anything that big. It's just so catastrophic if it bleeds. And then Ishan asks, uh, we do scapular humeral disarticulation. If you scapula will still protect the pores in future cases of trauma, even what are your thoughts on keeping scapula for trauma related Um I don't keep the scapula, and I don't, honestly, I mean that incidence of trauma that's going to, that the difference is going to be the fact, you know, the difference as to whether the thorax was penetrated or not is going to be really rare. And we don't see that much trauma here anyway. So I, look, I can't see that really as a justification um, to keep the scapula on. But if, you know, if you're in a situation where you do see a lot of trauma, um, maybe that makes sense. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna ligature this as well. As ligate it. All right. We've got a couple of big nerves in here. It's a big one, isn't it? Yeah. Okay, so a little bit of bleeding back here still. out of the muscle belly. Okay. 
Uh, no, we've been, famous last words, but no, we've been very fortunate and we've been very careful as well about making sure that anybody who has even a, the sniffles has to go home. Um, but that being said, nobody from our practice, even you know the ones that we sent home have had a positive test, so. So that's another big artery there. So there were two like paired axillary arteries. So strip it up like that. All right. Uh, it's not usually. Oh, okay. I think it's an anomaly. And we'll do our transfictional on that as well. You guys are getting more for your money than to see lots of ligatures. Do you encircling and transfixing or just... It's a, so your... My encircling becomes... I do encircling and transfixing. Encircling with the silk and transfixing with the PDF. Correct. Can we, uh, I think that will stay over there. Uh, uh, so that's a great question. Um, which so, so the question is, which is better, European College of Veterinary Surgeons, American College of Veterinary Surgeons, or fellowships? Um, and I assume you're talking about Australian fellowships, but um, the issue is that the ACVS, American College of Veterinary Surgeons, is universally accepted anywhere in the world whereas ECVS is only accepted in Australia and Europe and fellowships are only accepted in Australia. So if you want a degree or a, a specialist status that's recognized anywhere in the world, um, you would go with ACVS. Um, and if you're thinking about practicing in Europe or Australia, you'd go ECVS. The fact is that often you don't really have much choice because you're going to get into a program which is going to allow you to do one program, you know, one, one uh, specialty certification or another. If you're given the choice, you would go ACVS every time. Um, but like America, the U.S. does not accept the European college or the Australian college. So um, the problem is that the American College has made their um, their requirements for a program so onerous that it's very difficult for anybody outside of the U.S., certainly in, not in Australia, to have um, a U.S. resident. I trained my last U.S. resident. Um, she just finished her specialty exams this year, and she's the last one. We we cannot train American surgeons anymore. Uh, let's see where we are here. Um, can you zoom out please a little bit? We can't train, so we lost our ACVS residency program because the requirements are so intense. Um, let's see where we are here, that's great. Uh, 
so very frustrating for us because we had a good program and we trained good surgeons. All right, so this is infraspinatus, sorry, subscapularis here, and this is serratus ventralis here. And serratus ventralis is actually, interestingly, the place that you get the majority of the bleeding, that I get the majority of the bleeding when I do an amputation, because the vessels all disappear into the bone. You said you'd like to transect where it's where the tendon inserts onto the scapula. Yeah. Yeah. So that's if you like performing amputations apart from, you know, a dog moving away. Um I I don't mind performing amputations. I think it's it's kind of I mean it's kind of fun and it tests your anatomy and stuff. It's not my most exciting surgery. Um let me just see if I can zoom in here. Can you zoom in there for me, please? So I'm just on where I'm taking the serratus ventralis. Sorry, just zoom. Okay. Um, see where we are, where Laura's fingers are. Is that better? Yeah. Okay. Yep. So as I told you, this is where we get the majority of bleeding because the blood vessels actually retracts into the bone. So I'm just taking serratus ventralis off the medial aspect of the scapular spine. I'm sorry, the uh, scapula, medial aspect of the scapula. And once we get serratus ventralis off, then we're going to come around, just take the rhomboidus off the back, and we're done. Just see what we got down here. Get cautery turned up to 40, please. So I'm taking rhomboidus off the back here. Okay, so the leg is off there. Um, should just keep some pressure there. So that's the leg there. Can you zoom out for me? So big leg there. That's great, thank you. And I'll just put this on the back table here. I've dripped a little bit of blood on the floor. And let's see, we've got still a little bit of bleeding here. Can you lift up on that for me, please? I do get away with just one lap sponge, but I am pushing the friendship a little bit. Um, so that's my whole spay there. I mean, it's whole spay, whole amputation there. I know, uh, all good. Okay, and can you guys see that whole field? Yep. 
All right, so now what we'll do is we'll get the rest of my mepivacaine and inject it into the muscle bellies, into the trapezius up here, and for, or the serratus ventralis here, th um, latissimus dorsi here, the pectoral muscles down here. Can I get some OPDS, please? Thank you. So then when we go to close this, we're going to close the trapezius back here and rhomboidus over to the, sorry, trapezius here to the rhomboidus and latissimus dorsi caudally. There are books on the history of vet surgery. If you go onto Kindle, um, uh, there'd be lots of books out there. And the history of human surgery is really interesting as well. A couple of... Do I worry most about what? Hemorrhage. Hemorrhage, probably an adrenalectomy that's invading the vena cava. You have a question? Yep. Yeah. Yeah. So I am tacking it down to the serratus ventralis underneath. Um, so water for flush, but I was using, uh, sorry, no, I was using mepivacaine, which is a locally acting sodium channel blocker like uh, lidocaine or bupivacaine. And it just provides about four to six hours of really good quality pain relief. And by uh, stopping the pain cycle early on, you avoid the windup, which means that they're much more comfortable for the entire recovery period. And then we have Grover that says, hello, I am from Peru. Do you accept international internship in your country? Uh, so internships are a bit tricky because you have to be licensed in Australia in order to get an internship here. And so you have to go through the Foreign Veterinary Graduate Equivalency Program, which is difficult. Stefania is our, our anesthetist today and she is a licensed veterinarian in Uruguay, and she is trying to go through the program, but the exam got canceled because of COVID and all this nonsense. So I've heard of people going for two years trying to get licensed um, in Australia. So that's the only downside. We're happy to take international students, but you have to be fully licensed in Australia and Victoria in order to, to get a position here. Can I get some more OPDS, please? Mm -hmm. 
so just close my uh, trapezius and um, normal transversarius down to my superficial pectoral muscle here. Cut that a bit long. Yep. I don't know what I've done with my other needle driver. Needle driver. There it is. Just a bigger one. I uh, just to reduce dead space. I'm um, Karen. That's the reason why I tack it down. And then, what are the potential complications after an application in adults other than hemorrhage? Um, so hemorrhage is uh, m really only an issue during the surgery. I suppose it's possible that you could slip a ligature and they could bleed after surgery, although it doesn't happen often. Um, an interesting potential complication that can happen during the surgery, which I've never seen before, is if you inadvertently cut the axillary vein or the femoral vein on a back leg, iliac vein, femoral vein in a back leg, and don't realize it, and the central venous pressure is below the, the level that the vein is over the heart, you can suck air and create a big air embolism without knowing it. Um, and so that is a reported complication. I've never seen it before, um, but I think that's kind of interesting. Um, and then phantom pain would be the other one that we don't know if we get it or not. Um, so those would be the main complications that we can see. Um, 27 is young. We had, when I was working at Virginia Tech, um, we had a vet student who was a general in the army and was 48 um, as a vet student. So if it's what, you know, if it's your passion and what you want to do, there's no, you know, age is not a, a reason not to. The only consideration would be if you can afford to do it and you're in a family situation where you can go back to studying, um, like that and still support your family. Twenty seven is really young, by the way. <laughs> How old you today, Charles? Yeah. Um, I was 25 when I finished. So you'd be finishing at 31. That's still, that's still young. Nice surgery, sir. Thank you. Someone else said, what are your tips for an animal recovery from amputation experience in phantom pain? Uh, so we usually use either gabapentin or amantadine are the ones are the drugs that we use when we're suspecting phantom pain. Although again, I think it's hard to prove one way or another. Although sometimes you will have a dog that's particularly painful on palpation of the incision up near the uh, brachial plexus. Um, so I do not. And people that watch my videos will know I hardly ever put drains in. Um, if you you know if you close dead space and you do a good job of making sure that you're not having bleeding in your bed in your 
um, amputation stump, there's no reason to put a drain in. Drains increase the risk of infection, um, and so I avoid them whenever I can. If you are going to use a drain, make sure you use a closed suction drain like a Jackson Pratt rather than a Penrose drain. So what do we have here? That's going to come together really nicely. I will trim out some of that skin. Um, can you give me some counter tension? Just right here. Um, can I please have some more 2-0? Yes. Yep. So I'll have you, can we get two packs please? I'll have you start up here and work in my direction. And then when I catch up to you, I'll take over. Just another 2-0 please. Thank you. Uh, so generally, the first week is, is rough after an amputation, and then after that, they start on their road to recovery. By about two weeks, they're usually pretty good. I'm just doing an intradermal pattern. You can use mayos if you'd like. What's your take on endoprothesis in small animals? Is it still along the head? Uh, endoprosthetics? Yeah. So endoprosthetics for limb salvage surgery. Um, I, um, like I invented the first generation endoprosthetic, um, and it was it was good. But the problem is that we had a lot of biomechanical failures that proximally, and so they've done stuff to improve bone ingrowth and stuff proximally. Um, and so, if you're going to do a limb salvage, I think that using an endoprosthetic makes sense, so you, so you don't have to have a bone bank. Um, if you happen to have a fresh cadaver bone, um, it makes sense to use it because there's some potential for bone ingrowth, whereas with an endoprosthetic, obviously, you're never going to get any bone ingrowth. So that area is always going to be biomechanically vulnerable to failure. 
So, and I think that there are other alternatives to endoprosthetic like ulna rollover or manus transfer, um, which are probably better because there's much lower risk of infection uh, because you're using a vascularized bone uh, construct. So if I had the option of doing an um, ulna rollover or a managed transfer, that would be my preference. The other one that's interesting is Sarah Boston did a limb shortening limb salvage where she published just taking out about six centimeters of distal radius on a Labrador and, and dogs can accommodate for the difference in leg length uh, between the two legs um, up to about 30% of the length of their leg. And so um, that dog did particularly well. And again, there's no risk of infection. Um, you don't have to worry about having a bone bank. You don't have to worry about having, um, or I won't say no risk of infection, lower risk of infection. You don't have to have a bone bank. You don't have to have a um, cadaver bone available. Good morning from Israel. Thanks for uh, sharing all the videos and lives. Do you do something to decrease the inspiration of the smoke? Um, so the question is, that there's some concern about the smoke plume from using electric cautery being carcinogenic. Um, I, I have not actively evacuated smoke. My feeling is that Number one, they say that you have to you have to literally smoke a whole cubic centimeter of tissue in a pipe in order to have the same effect as three cigarettes. And I don't think that we're vaporizing a whole cubic centimeter of tissue. The other issue is that um, if there is a higher risk of nasal cancer or lung cancer due to inspired smoke, we would see it in surgeons because surgeons typically do so many surgeries and are a very select isolated group. And I don't think that we do see an increased incidence of nasal cancer, or lung cancer in surgeons. If we did, then that would be more evidence suggesting that we should be evacuating. That being said, if I have an intern or a student or whatever that's uncomfortable with it, I'm happy to evacuate it and we just use the suction tube, um, but it's not something that I normally actively do. Is there any additional screening required to specialize in surgery in the US? Yeah, so. Sorry, I have found this screening is very intriguing and important. So, once you finish vet school, generally what happens is you go into a rotating internship or you go into practice. The rotating internship is a year. And then, if you want to do surgery still, you have to go and do, often you have to do a surgical internship. And some people even go and do a master's in addition to the surgical internship, and then you get a surgical residency, which is three years, and then after your surgical residency, you take your, your boards, your surgery boards, and then that's when you become a specialist. Um, so it is quite an involved process that has become more and more competitive over the years. So it used to be that most people just went straight in from an internship into a residency, but now I would say that that would be a rarity most people have to go out and, and do something else, surgical internship, master's degree, publications, things like that in order to get in. I don't even know what time it is. It's probably too late. That's right. Yeah, don't worry about it. So the word specialist 
is a protected term. You can't just call yourself a specialist without having the, the qualification of having done a residency and taken the board certification examination. Um, like you, you, in any advertising in America or in Australia, I know, and probably in Europe as well, that word specialist cannot be used in conjunction with um, any kind of advertising or anything as a veterinarian unless you are truly a specialist. Um, I've always been a Labrador Retriever guy. Um, I've had four, um, but I also really like German short hair pointers and Beazlas, but really any dog that's friendly, um, I like. I might swing around that side, Laura, and start taking over there just so we can get out of this theater. Is that all right? Yeah. Someone asked if there, is, if there are any other surgeries um, I am not technically meant to be doing surgery today, so I don't think that I have any more. Can you just retract on that for me? Um, I don't think I have any more surgeries, but if I do, I will try to live stream them. Yep, yeah, so we're going to go through post-op medications and orders. Pain relief, we will do. Are we on fentanyl CRI right now? Um, probably just methadone, and if and if he's painful, we can switch to a fentanyl CRI. Um, I'd like him to have a fentanyl patch, um, and probably codeine as well to go home. Uh, I can't remember which non-steroidal he's already on. Okay, so um, we'll start him on meloxicam. Uh, just a uh, just a normal dose. Uh, any antibiotics? No antibiotics. Other medications? No other medications. Fluids until eating? Yep, just maintenance. Any sedation? Yeah, he can have whatever he needs. So sedation wise, either aspromazine or trazodone or something like that if he needs it. Uh, rechecks? Uh, rechecks at. Uh, one in two weeks, and then they have to have a, a chemo appointment at one week to discuss um, with the internal medicine department about what chemo protocol they're going to go on. I'm going to have to run that in the other direction. Uh, no, I think that's it. Thank you. You always get this lump or this line caudally because the sub-Q fat is so much thicker caudally than it is cranially. So you always get this kind of ridge and it usually goes away with time to some degree.
dog person? Um, I am a dog person, although I've had one cat that was really great. His name was Leo, a tuxedo cat, and he was just spectacular. And he and my Labrador at the time used to just sit and spoon and lick each other. He was basically a dog in a cat's clothing. Uh, so, in this theater, it's me and Laura, our intern, and Stefania, our anesthetist. Another theater running at the same time, which is just finishing up a total hip replacement, and then be rolling in with two more cases into this theater and the other adjacent theater right now. So we've probably got about 15 cases today. 12, 15? Yeah. Um, so this was an osteosarcoma, which is really common in large and giant breed dogs. Um, we see a lot of them. It was in the distal radius, which is the most common site. Um, and it was typical appearance on radiographs. No evidence of chest mats. I'm just going to pass that underneath. Yep. Okay, that is it. So I will stop the recording now. And hold on just a second on that one. Let me just come over and make sure there are no questions I haven't answered. Uh, so theater is what Australians call the operating room, operating theater, operating suite. Um, and what else? So the reason why they occur in large and giant breed dogs is because they're faster rate of growth. Um, and so there's more bone turnover, which means there's more opportunity for mutation and more opportunity for cancer to form. And so there's a question uh, so for vets that go straight into practice, they mainly just spay, neuter, cystotomy, et cetera, with more so diagnosing the issue and recommending specialists for whatever the issue may be. So um, Denzel, that depends on where you are. Um, in That depends on where you are. Um, in countries or, or in countries or, or in countries which um, have a lot of specialists, um, that may be the case unless there are people that have uh, economic um, restraints on their ability to um, to go for referral, but there are about six billion people in the world that geographically don't have access to specialists um, in um, you know Africa, India, China, uh, Malaysia, um, all over the place. There are very very few specialists, and so um, they don't have the access to to refer. And so in those countries, vets probably do a lot more, so fracture repairs, things like that. So um, question about carcinogens in animals. So secondhand smoke is carcinogenic. Um, there are a couple of other things that I can't remember right now, but there aren't many things that have been established as carcinogens in, um, in animals. So, and thank you very much for the happy birthday wishes and hope you guys have a great day. I think that's all the questions. And um, I probably won't be live streaming until next week because I start cutting again on Monday, but we'll see if we can get Jimmy or James to come in here and live stream something today, tomorrow. Anyway, thanks a lot for watching. Make sure you subscribe to our channel, turn on notifications so that you'll get a ding on your phone the next time we live stream. And we will talk to you soon.